Okay, thank you for joining uh, our today topic, should I or shouldn't I, where we discuss, you know, um, whether or not to open the storefront if you're an interior designer and, you know, what the benefits are, what the risks are, what are the do's, what are the don'ts, who should open one, who shouldn't open one. Mm. So uh, we've prepared a lot of really cool questions. Um, this is a series of our business success skills webinars that we do and host every two weeks. And we record those uh, on YouTube. So the easiest way to access is um, either through my Instagram uh, bio, you know, on Benny underscore Frowine, um, where you have the link, uh, or you can, I think, also go on YouTube and just um, Google or like search for business success skills, uh, Schumacher, and then uh, you should find, you know, a series of uh, very different ones. Um, super insightful. And I think there's always, you know, there's pretty much we've covered a lot of topics right now. But coming back to today, um, I would love to start introducing my three panelists, um, creatives, powerhouses, and shop owners today. Um, and um, Annie, who is helping me in the background, I would love if you could share your screen now. Perfect, that works. Um, let me, you know, I always do it by alphabet. Let me start with um, with Dennis. Um, Dennis and uh, Annie, if you could just exactly go through. So Dennis is based in Houston and is the principal of Dennis Perkin Design Group. He creates interiors that are bold, eclectic, and I would also say unmistakably his own. Um, be it traditional or modern, maximalism or minimalism, his projects always reflect quality and sophistication. Um, his work has been published by many local and national shelter magazines. And Dennis um, has a shop um, called Moxie, where you sell very high-end furniture and unique furniture pieces. So it is on, you know, you can see it online. Check it out. Uh, Google Moxie Houston. It's really beautiful. Thank you for joining Dennis today. Thank you for having me. Um, Second is Laura Hodges. Um, Laura has been influenced by, and I, that I have to read, Norwegian grandmother, British mother, Jamaican father. And with that, Laura developed early an appreciation for travel and diverse cultures, having traveled extensively to over 30 countries. So I think that is also what influences her, you know, international aesthetic, along with the love for unique and dynamic environments. In 2018, Home and Design featured Laura as one of the designers to watch. And also, Laura has, what a surprise on today's panelist, uh, you know, a panel, uh, has a storefront. Um, also, check it out online. Um, you can even buy there. Um, and you can, as you watch, also select your favorite pieces in the background, because Laura is actually in her shop. So uh, we can do this, you know, multi-channel. Um, Laura, thank you for joining. It's really a pleasure having you here. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Thank you so much. Um, and then last but not least, Patrick, Patrick Mealy um, has a degree in art history and cultural studies. And his aesthetics is influenced by the interplay of art, architecture, decorative arts, and fashion throughout history. Uh, and I think, you know, you really see his passion for a wide range of styles. Um, Patrick Cultural's rooms that tell a layered story, I think this picture uh, tells a lot of stories with a lot of layers. I think it's really beautiful um, based on the architecture location and the people that inhabit them. Um, and also Patrick has a fabulous, uh, fabulous storefront. And uh, I just learned, Patrick, that you move also online with your store very soon, right? Um, okay, right. awesome. So everyone check it out. This is the offline version, but as pretty as this, you're going to see it um, uh, on the internet. So Patrick, thank you very much for joining today. Um, very you. thankful for you to be here. Thank you. Um, so starting, I, I think all of us, we would love to get to know you a little better. And um, I would love to know, you know, you all own a store. I would love to know, Laura, maybe we start with you. Which piece that you have in your store do you also have in your home? And why do you chose to bring that home? Uh, well, actually, 
coincidentally, this guy right here, this little juju hat, you can see him in the background. He's actually not that little, he's actually quite large. Um, I, that was one of the first things I put um, in my home before we had a shop, um, and then I loved it, so we actually brought it into the shop, so it was sort of the other way around. Um, but I love it. It's, um, it's, it's from Cameroon. Um, it's, it's, a, it's actually in Cameroon, they use them as hats. It's called a juju hat. Um, but here we decorate with them because they're beautiful and uh, it just has a lot of sculptural texture. Um, they just, they really just can stand on their own. So I love them. Amazing. I think that uh, name will have, you know, a search in Google search now uh, because we all want to look at it better, you know. Thank you, Laura. Um, Dennis, what do you have from your shop at home and why? Um, that question, that actually changes almost weekly. Um, <laughs> cause it's, you know, I'm always trying to, I always, I love to buy and I love to hunt. So I'll find something and I'm like, okay, I'll put it in the store and if it doesn't sell or I'll put it in my house and I'll take it to the store. The last thing I would say, the most wonderful thing I've done, it's a Milo Bachman chair and I did it in a, um, a Latigra fabric, which is kind of over the top, but it's pretty fabulous. I, we don't carry a lot of new products, so it wouldn't be in the store as well. So, but anyway, that's what I've. Have it now. Sounds pretty fabulous. Uh, and Patrick, you what? What do you have something from your store at home, and and what what is it? I relate to both to both of you because I love juju hats so much. We have them at home and uh, at the shop as well. And my my house and my store are constantly in flux, things coming and things going, and old things that I'm sick of looking at. Perhaps at the shop that haven't sold come back home. But um, recently. I, I gifted to uh, my family a Wayne Pate. Do you guys know the artist Wayne Pate at all? His work, um, he and I became friendly on Instagram and I reached out to him when I first opened the store because I loved his work so much and said, would you ever consider showing your pieces in, at the shop? And, and he, he said yes. So he's moving, um, he's moving abroad and it's probably one of the last larger pieces that I'd be able to get my hands on. I recently took one home and, and bought one from him. So I'm, I'm happy to have one. Fantastic. Um, all very personal stories, I love that. Um, so you all have an interior design shop and uh, Patrick, maybe start with you right away because you went last, the last question. Um, what made you, what made you open it? Um, tell us what, you know, tell us about that. Like how did you like get to all of this? Well, I'll tell you the, the whole truth of how I opened that shop because I've, um, I grew up in retail and in restaurants. So that was always been my world growing, growing up, it, it, you know, uh, having a relationship with the public and kind of romancing people. And I started my career working in the retail fashion world for, the, for interiors with Ralph Lauren and with Kate Spade. So the whole retail world has been in my, in my DNA, in my blood. I love shopping. I love, um, I love my relationships that I've, I've made with different shop owners, gallery owners. Um, I, I feel like I always uh, learned a great deal from the various stores or galleries that I traveled to. And so I grew up in this town in Greenwich in Connecticut and um, I always had my eye on this one particular little corner and thought to myself, if I ever had the ability to have a little shop of my own one day, I, I really like that particular spot. And the for lease sign went on the window and I called the landlord and it was within my budget. Um, that is one tip I would definitely give to anybody who is thinking about getting into the retail business is to hopefully find a, a landlord that is benevolent and fair and, um, you know, can work with you. I don't know if you guys have a similar experience, but during the, the past COVID uh, months, I, I've been lucky enough to have that uh, great landlord. So. We, I got the shop and, um, and also felt like in this community and in the surrounding towns that there really wasn't uh, an offering that was exciting me. And I felt like I knew there was an audience out there that felt the same way, having grown up in, in, the, in the area. So I was excited to bring, um, you know, that point of view to sort of an underserved area in, in, in that kind of category. So yeah, interesting. Uh, yeah, super interesting. I mean, Dennis, is, has, that, was that your motivation too, or was the start and the beginning completely different? Um, basically, like I said before, I, I love to, um, I love the hunt for things. Um, 
And after a while, when you you find things and you store them and you store them and you store them, <laughs> you may have <clears throat> quite a bit of things on hand and uh, you're thinking, wow, I'm paying all this rent for a storage unit. Why not try to work that into retail? Um, so that was one of the things. Another thing I, I love doing interior design projects, obviously, but I also love the retail side because I think I'm probably somewhere in here a frustrated set designer. And so I love that I love that you, you have just this ability or this uh, freedom to create a space that maybe someone wouldn't live with in their house, but it makes them expand their their vision, you know, just to open up to things that could happen. So I enjoyed that part, this, the, uh, you know, merchandising, that kind of thing. So that's kind of how I did it. And we were very fortunate as well. Um, to, we've been here going on nine years. Um, we were fortunate enough after 2008, we, we were able to purchase the building, which thank God, because I and mean, we can talk about that later, but there was things over the years that if I would have been renting maybe, you know, and, and having the space that I had, it probably would not have been as feasible to be able to continue. So anyway, it's just like the stars all aligned and it was time to do it. Yeah, thank you, Dennis. Laura, how did you start your shop? Uh, what did you, what motivated you? Uh, similar story, sort of. Um, we actually, my husband and I, we worked together. And um, at the time that we were deciding to work together, because I started on my own initially, uh, and then he started to work with me. And then we thought, okay, we need an office space. Um, so we started looking around for office spaces. We ended up accidentally sort of um, buying a building. I won't say accidentally, it wasn't accidentally. It, it was accidentally in that we bought it as an investment and then decided to move into it and then decided to open a store in it. So <laughs> it kind of all happened sort of at the same time and just happy coincidences that we're, you know, we had the opportunity to, to do that. And so um, I have always wanted a store. Uh, my husband didn't want a store at first. <laughs> so um, it kind of was like, okay, well, how are we going to work this out? Because now we have to hire somebody to work in the store. And so um, it fell together very well. I will say that we've, we've been very fortunate with it, but um, it kind of all sort of fell in together at the same time. Um, what, I, what I do, what I, you know, so what I do here kind of between the line from all of us is either you, you had like a passion for, or wanting a shop always somehow in your fantasy, you know, in your dreams, or you like, you just love stuff and you need a, you need a sales outlet, you know, some, you know, but like somewhere in between, you always had a passion for that. And I always see summarizing that for everyone who's listening, because we might, you know, all of us, the rest might either feel that too or not feel it so much. Um, I just find that interesting. Um, so I'm sure when you opened your, job, uh, your shop, you somehow had kind of a strategy, you know, like a specialization or what you wanted the shop to be. Um, Dennis, what was that shop? Did you like, did you really like start with the pieces you had or did you, did you think about what you wanted to specialize on or did it come later? Um, a little bit of both. Um, you know, in Houston, you know, shopping and we shop everywhere for, for projects um, online, you know, has been great over the years to open up the world to be able to find product. But uh, there wasn't really necessarily a store that, uh, that I could find locally that catered to some of the things that, for my projects. So that was one thing that, you know, kind of led us down that path. And then the other was having things already. Um, so that was kind of why. Um, and, and now you specialize mostly on like? We sell everything from 17th century to yesterday. Um, but we sell a lot of furniture. You know, we do, we smell, we sell what we call in industry smalls, but not a lot. Um, mostly furniture and lighting within the uh -huh. store. Yeah. Um, Patrick, what do you specialize on? What's your niche? So, see, um, th that is what we've sort of been working on during, during the past uh, five months time. I'm going to expand the offering. Um, we, we also sell quite a bit of furnishings you know, kind of one of a kind, unique little quirky pieces. Uh, I decided that there wasn't, looking around, there wasn't really a resource and based on the customers that have been coming in, uh, yeah. a resource for really well done upholstery and well done uh, 
beautiful fabrics and wallpaper. So what we're gonna do now is we're gonna offer some lines, boutique niche lines of uh, textiles and wallpaper that I'm really excited about. And we are gonna offer upholstery services, window hardware. Um, it's gonna, we have a beautiful line of window hardware. Now we have a curtain specialist that we're gonna be able to you know, send out to tons of people in the area who you know, came to us. They've all worked with designers at one point, but, but they constantly want to have some change and um, they didn't really have that resource. So we're gonna expand into those categories, which I'm excited about. Um, we also have tabletop. We have wonderful line with uh, Nicholas Newcomb. I don't know if you know that potter. He and I are doing collaboration together that I'm excited about launching this fall um, based on color field art and uh, lots of different artists. I started when I first opened, I always wanted to have Noguchi lighting and they were kind enough to uh, agree to that. The Noguchi didn't work that well, never really wound up selling it in the area. So that was kind of a, a bummer. You know, I think it evolves and changes over time. It'll be three years. Um, this November. And um, so it, it's constantly changing, but I'm excited to get a little bit more focused on, on offering people these wonderful textiles and the service uh, that goes along with various mm. you know, interior components. Very interesting. Thank you. Uh, Laura, I feel, you know, just judging from the background, I think you specialize in a tiny bit different. Tell us what, 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 you, uh, what you specialize on. Um, well, I felt like whenever I had my design projects, you come to that end point and you just want to, you need to style it, you need to give it some personality. And I was, um, like you guys, having a hard time finding unique, special pieces that really spoke to the type of projects that we were doing. Um, I would be sourcing these things, but then once I found it, I was like, well, I have to keep finding this stuff all the time. And wouldn't it be cool to just have a space that I could source from for our own projects and that other designers could source from, that our clients could source from. So we do mostly small accessories, throw pillows, blankets, a lot of lifestyle um, pieces. We do a lot that's local. So basically everything we have is either local uh, or hopefully all of the above, local, fair trade, sustainable. Um, a lot of the work that we do is sustainable. So we try to keep everything, you know, so, I mean, there's, there's sustainable furniture, there's sustainable fabrics and things like that. But what we have in the shop is also a lot of sustainable lifestyle things. So, um, you know, wood brushes instead of plastic brushes, um, beeswax wraps, and, you know, to use instead of uh, cling film, that sort of thing. So some of the stuff is just lifestyle that we can help our clients with after they move in. And then uh, we have a lot of accessories and gift as well. We found that gift ended up being kind of a big category for us. Um, so that was really good. Amazing. I mean, I find this amazing, you know, obviously, I mean, I knew it a little before, but um, I find it amazing that you all have such different shops and I'm really excited to hear from you, you know, whether the challenges independently from really what you from the product category specialize on, whether they are similar um, and talking about challenges, you know, it is running a shop must be so different from running an interior design business. Um, Laura, what is you know, for you, the biggest challenges uh, at the beginning and now, yeah, tell us about it. Yeah, um, well, just, just it's two separate businesses. <laughs> so, I mean, we went, I, I went into it thinking, okay, we're just gonna have a shop. Uh, it'll be all the same kind of things that we would have in our projects. So, you know, there's a natural uh, relationship there between the shop and, um, and the design business where and we're actually located in the same building. We have the shop in the front of the building, we have the studio in the back so somebody can come in and talk to us at the shop and then we can take them in the back if they wanna see some design projects or if they just wanna to talk to us about a project. We've had a lot of people come in and just want to talk to us about design projects, but then they kind of, you know, walk through the shop to get here. And so there's just, a, there's a great relationship there. The challenge has been um, balancing the two because we, for instance, right now are really, really busy with design projects. And then our online shop kind of took off. So then it was like, oh, <laughs> okay. So now we have to make sure that we have somebody who can do all the online stuff, but we're just a bunch of designers. So <laughs> now we have to make sure that who's gonna, who's gonna take care of the online, who's gonna take care of the shop, who's gonna, you know, so we're all wearing multiple hats all the time. It's a small business, we're all wearing multiple hats, but just, you know, sort of allotting the time to the shop separately from the design business it's a happy balance. That's what we try to go for is a balance of the two. Patrick, what do you find 
you know, the most challenging part of basically running two different businesses? Well, um, I'll tell you what, I would never have done the shop. I have a, my mother and I run this business really together. So that's another reason why I opened the store. I had that built in um, partner there and she, she really runs the shop. I, I found it challenging, just like Laura described. Um, I'm trying to get that, to that happy medium between the two, you know, um, but we're growing. And so it has been truly a challenge to, to figure out how to balance it all. Because I, I do think that the most successful shop owners out there that I know of, for instance, John Darian is, is a good friend of mine and is somebody who I greatly you know, admire as a shopkeeper. An example is a retail person. He's there all the time still. You know, 30 years, I think that he just celebrated his anniversary. And I think it's because he's there every day and um, his clients, uh, you know, see him engaged. And I, so I'm trying to still figure out that balance. Um, it's wonderful, I think, when you have enough space to have your office located. And if you find that, if you're out there considering opening a shop, um, I think what Laura, like you mentioned, having your design studio in the back, that's a really great synergy. Um, I don't have that in Greenwich. It's a very small little 400, 500 square foot shop. There's no basement. So there's, it's, very, it's got challenges, but, um, and it turns around seasonally, you know, so we're growing and learning at the same time too. It's not yeah. easy, right guys? I mean, it's, it's, it's definitely a challenge for sure. But fun one. Yeah, De Dennis, is your challenges similar to those of Patrick and Laura? Or is it something totally different? It actually is uh, totally aligned with theirs. Uh, sh quickly, you know, this is this is the second time that I've opened Moxie. So I opened Mox uh, a store in 2006 and um, by myself doing design work. And it was a smaller store, uh, we, but it was a good size store. We had probably 1,800, 2,000 square feet. Um, but for me at that time, I had one other employee. And so, the balance of being able to run a retail store and do design work completely was too much for me at the time. So, because, you know, in order to do, if I was, if I was enslaved at the store, because there wasn't someone to take care of it and for, you have to be open, you're going to be open. I, I think, you know, so I couldn't just put a note on the door and say, I'll be back because you don't get that customer. Maybe you come back. So, it didn't work out. So it was a, for about two years. And then finally one day I was like, okay, this is too much. So I closed that store. The re our success now, I, I have business partners. And, you know, I, one of my best clients told me one time, he said, you know, partnerships are either the best thing in the world or they're usually terrible. And this has been an incredible partnership that's lasted going on nine years. I'm knocking on everything right here. Um, and so I have that help. And like Laura, we're completely integrated retail and design in the same, under the same roof. So, um, which is nice because, you know, it's, it, you, you're not torn between two different places. First of all, you can uh, be doing business uh, with a client, a design client, if somebody comes from for retail, you can take care of them too. So, but my deal is that I have a good team and partners and everybody kind of wears their hat. And that's why for us it works. Mm -hmm. um, you know, now comes my personally my favorite question, and that is, you know, which business should help which? So, should the shop help to you to get projects, or should projects help you to sell pieces from the shop? Um, I don't know who wants to go first. Laura, do you want to go first? Yeah. Um, we opened the shop initially uh, to some extent as a passion. It's a passion for me, for me definitely. Um, but also sort of from a marketing standpoint too, uh, we were able to have things in the shop that we could um, use on our design projects. So for sure, the design firm is the 95% of our uh, focus and um, the shop definitely supports it. However, I will say for sure that having the shop, um, you know, we buy things for the shop that we can use in our design projects. So if 
I mean, we do sell some jewelry, we sell some candy, some chocolates and things like that, which obviously, you know, we can give to our clients as gifts. <laughs> that works too. Um, but there's nothing in the shop that we wouldn't be able to use on a project because we don't want to have dead stock that sits around that we're like, okay, well, why do we have this? And I certainly don't want anything in the shop that doesn't represent our aesthetic. So. And I, and I find also interesting, you know, with you being very close to like what you put into your shop. I mean, you've fallen in love with the pieces why wouldn't you then feel they should, you know, they wouldn't fit to your client? Right. Uh, Dennis, how, how do you do that? Does your shop help you to get projects or is it more that the projects help you to sell pieces from the shop or how do you see that? I think for us, it's a little bit of both uh, because we have a lot of space and um, we've been very fortunate we just did a complete remodel of the store. We have about 8,500 square feet. So we're in Texas where things are less expensive. <laughs> yeah. so, um, so I've had this space to create, you know, vignettes rooms that would be like in a home. So I think when the customer walks in, um, maybe not a design client, but just somebody coming in for retail to see what the store is all about, I think they can get a feel for what, you know, you can do aesthetically for, through design. Now, 80% of our sales are to other to the trade. So whether that be my design firm or other designers. And of course, I'm the number one client at Moxie. I should be, hopefully, right? Since uh, I buy the stuff. So, and you know, you still, even though you have that much space and, you, and I'm constantly buying, I can never, you, I can't get enough things that are gonna fulfill every one of my projects. However, um, I think for us, it's just, I think it's both. I think it works both ways. I think it's um, kind of even both, you know, people coming in, they may hire you for design jobs because we, that does happen. But, um, but mostly I think it is more selling onto our projects and for other uh, but just, ju just because I find it interesting. So you did have cases where people walked in maybe several times and then said, listen, I have a huge house. I feel overwhelmed. I love the style of your store. Uh, you know, can you can you help us uh, create a beautiful home? Yes, that happens quite a bit. Thank you. <laughs> uh, Laura, you're nodding too. So that happened to you too. Yeah, we've actually had clients that never shop in the store. And actually, you know, what's funny is that usually our clients do not shop in our store, and our customers don't usually become clients, but some of them do. But it's usually that they're coming in to ask us about design. And then they hire us. And then I say, okay, you know, we're looking around. If they ever want a gift from the shop for somebody else, maybe for a friend or something, they, they still ask us to choose it for them. So they're still like high, they're still like looking at us as like designers, you know what I mean? Even if they're just shopping. So interesting. Yeah. Pat Patrick, how is it for you? You know, like uh, what business supports what business, especially now also with the shift that you are doing in, in your business model for the shop? Well, the bulk of the business is definitely the, the design projects, you know, as an overall uh, umbrella business. But I would say, you know, I, I relate to both Dennis and Laura. Um, we, I think I share the same experience. The design projects did not come really out of the shop until probably about a year and a half into the three years. And I was wondering, like, when when's that not going to come? Um, but it did. And... You know, um, I don't know. I, I, you really kind of summed it all up there, Laura and Dennis. Um, I, I think, I think it's a it's a back and forth, and it's a, it's a balance of the two. Um, um, I would love just because we are speaking about that right now. I, we already got like two three questions in our Q and A um, uh, room, and for everyone who is listening and watching. If you hover with your mouse over the screen at the bottom, you see, you know, a little icon that says Q&A. Please do feel free to enter your questions. And I try to bake it in uh, as best as I can. Um, we have one, um, uh, you know, one client who has been asking, you know, do you feel the storefront has helped keep your interior design projects in the pipeline? So I think we've just uh, answer that, that all of you said yes, you know, after one and a half years for Patrick and so on and others, you know, you do get projects through that. Um, how also, how do you staff? Um, uh, I think that's also an interesting question and I, and I, it's an anonymous attendee, but I would expect, you know, that question is, do you have your designers also be in the shop or do you have different staff? 
how do you do that? Maybe Dennis, you want to start and, and Laura, you go after. I have a, a business partner that runs the store that manages, which is nice because you have an owner present. So, you know, I would say no one's going to take care of your business as good as someone that has a, a you know, an ownership of it. Um, so we have, you know, everyone here kind of wears their hat, like I said before, has a hat to wear, whereas most of the time I'm in the, in the field doing design work, but I have an ownership, you know, here to do uh, management of the store, the retail store. And um, so that's kind of how we work. I mean, I think I was. Laura, how do you guys do that? Um, so we initially decided, um, we tried to be kind of strategic about it since it is retail. It's not always busy, you know, Wednesday at two o'clock, we're not going to be like, you know, stampeded by customers. So, um, we chose to hire people who we could also have do design work. So, um, the people who we have, we've had, sorry for the fire trucks, we have a fire uh, station right on the street. Um, we hired, um, We've had two or three different people who have been working in the shop with us and we kind of rotate about who is actually going to be in the shop at any given time. Um, but this way it kind of works for us really well because we are a small business. It's a small shop. It's only like, you know, 300, three, 400 square feet. It's, it's quite small. So we don't necessarily need somebody who only does the shop like all the time. We wanted somebody who can, sorry, the fire truck. Um, <laughs> who can in their downtime do drawings or sourcing or whatever else needs to be done. But we also wanted somebody who, when, so when a customer comes in, they can speak really um, eloquently, if you will, about the design projects that we do. So if I'm not here and somebody does want to talk about doing a design project, this person can also walk them down the hall and show them a design project that we're working on and they're familiar with it enough to be able to speak to it. Um, mm -hmm. so that they can address both sides of the business. Patrick, do you also do overlapping uh, with your teams or do you have that completely separate? No, so my mother, so Pat, really is the shop. Uh, run, she runs the shop. I try, I'm going to now try to be there at least a day fully or two per week. Whereas before I, I was sort of in and out, you know, a batch of hours would fluctuate throughout the week depending on the projects. Um, but no, I don't, have, I don't have people in the shop that are working on design. That's yeah. true. Yeah. Interesting. So there also doesn't seem to be one right, one wrong, right? It is really about like the individual circumstances. Um, the same person asked also, you know, um, do you do normal business hours for the store or by appointment? Um, I think that also refers to, I, I think then, as you said that, you know, once you open, you open, you can't just like put a sign to, so how do you do this? Do you do it by appointment? Do you, or do you really commit to retail opening hours? For us, we do commit. I mean, we're open Monday through Saturday, specific hours. Um, and then we're usually here hours afterwards. So <laughs> you can come by any time. But uh, yes, I, I, I know there are people that do have appointment only stores other than just through the pandemic. I mean, that's a different situation now. Uh, and if it works for them, you know, I, I, that's great, but it just didn't seem to work for me before. Um, because like I said, people will come maybe once or twice, but if you, if they come a couple of times and you're not there, they might get a little frustrated. And so we committed to being here set hours. Laura, you do the same. Yes. Right. So we are open Wednesday through Saturday, um, 11 to 5. Um, those are very specific hours based on when we felt like the retail was going to be the strongest. Um, we certainly have people that are like, oh, I wish you open on a Monday at 3 o'clock or some random hour. But for the most part, people are working during those hours. We're here, though. So we take appointments and we say, hey, you know, our studio is right there. If you want to stop in on a Monday at 3 o'clock, just let us know and we'll open the door. Um, you know, and right now, of course, we're open by appointment because of the pandemic. Um, we're, because we're small, it's sort of hard to do that social distancing in such a small space. So that's why we're just doing appointment only right now. Yeah, and Patrick, how do you guys do it? We have the same hours, Laura and I. I think that that, that works for us too. Um, you know, but it, you, you learn the first year that August in, in Connecticut, is, there's no one really there. So, you, you know, you don't have to be open six days a week um i also think it's interesting that in COVID has proven it that the appointment or perhaps having a shop open maybe it's only three days a week 
for, for a certain, I'm not, you know, not the kind of operation that you're running, Dennis, but um, to entice a client or, you know, the audience to get there on a particular day or a particular set of hours um, versus having the flexibility, you know, in, in the customer's mind that they, they could go any day of the week, um, perhaps they never get there. There's one shop, there's one gallery, for instance, in Connecticut, they have a huge online uh, business. It's called Mongers. They specialize in architectural uh, salvage pieces and they've got a number of different dealers there. They're only open on um, Sundays from 10 to five to the public. Wow. The rest of the days, and it is packed. You cannot get in, you cannot get in. And I think that that's kind of an interesting, not that I'm looking to open one day a week, but um, I don't know. I think it's, I think that too is changing. Mm -hmm. hours and days and how you have to operate. Interesting, super interesting. Um, Carter uh, Averbeck asks, what are some pitfalls you have had to learn from or overcome? And I love that question because uh, I'm sure you've all stumbled you know, across a couple of surprises and, and, and pitfalls. Um, I don't know, Dennis, do you wanna go first? Like what were you like two or three things that if I ask you, you know, I want to open a, a store tomorrow, you said, well, be aware of that. Right. Um, I think for me, because I have these, uh, sometimes I'm a big dreamer and, you know, I've got in my mind, visualize what I want to do and how I want to do it. I think for me, it was trying to do too much of one, you know, trying to do too many different things uh, and not having maybe the support to do it. Um, so I think expansion sometimes is, it's a great thing, but I think sometimes it can be, if you're not ready, then uh, it can be very, very challenging. So I've kind of learned, and I know my business partners have too, to hold me back and tighten the reins a little bit and say, oh, that sounds great, but how's, how are we going to make that happen? So for me, that would be one thing. Having your, you know, and I also believe that you should have your, uh, what your vision is and stick to it. Once you, you know what I'm saying, try to re remember what your goal is. Mm -hmm. um, Patrick, what were, you know, also you told us at the beginning, you're shifting a little bit. So tell us what, what are you, some of your biggest pitfalls you, you needed to learn from or overcome? I'm learning from Dennis as I go along here. <laughs> I, I agree with you so much, what you just had to say. Um, I think trying to do too much all at once, I am a, I suffer from that big time. Um, I will say this, that, you know, I, the reason too I wanted to open a shop, I'm sure you guys might agree, like you mentioned, Dennis, is really to get your vision out there, to share with the public what you're capable of. Um, and, you know, when I first opened, I think I might have kind of uh, put maybe one too many layers or too many cherries on the cake and just, perhaps, you know, entice people to come into the shop, certainly. And they would come in and they'd look around and then they just leave. They, you know, they'd look around and they would, they, would, they would love their experience. And I think it was genuine, but I think they were intimidated to a certain degree because I really wanted to, to bring kind of, um, you know, a New York level experience up to Connecticut and something interesting. And I, I am trying to just adjust my, my level of, whatever's in my mind creatively. Um, that's something I've learned. I'm trying to learn how to do more. Um, Interesting. Sort of really listen to what your clients are looking for and then take, take what, they're, what they request and, and try to execute that too through your own lens, you know? Um, yeah. Look, yeah, that's... Uh, that's <laughs> That's interesting, Patrick. I, I would love to hear, you know, from Laura what her biggest surprise was. You know, is that along the same lines or was that something different from you? Um, I think the biggest pitfall, well, I, I definitely try to do too much. You can ask my family about that. They're always telling me that I'm doing too much. Um, maybe that's just the whole entrepreneur side of things where you're like, oh, we could do that and we could do that. What else? Um, when we started selling online, we didn't really <laughs> anticipate like that it, that in and of itself is a whole different thing too. It's like, okay, well you only have 400 square feet. Where are you gonna pack everything up? Where are you gonna store all of this extra stuff? Because 
we started opening, we, when we first started opening the store, I thought, let's just have a couple of each thing because then it's special. We don't want, I don't want like stacks and rows and rows of, you know, the same thing like you're at Target or something. I want it to look special. And a lot of what we have is very unique. Um, it's handmade, it's locally made and all this lovely things. So, but then of course, you know, you go and put that online and you sell out <laughs> those two things. Well, now you need to buy more. And instead of buying more every single time, it's like, okay, well now we, maybe we should have some back stock where we're gonna store all that stuff, where we're gonna pack it all up, where we're gonna, you know, packing materials everywhere. Um, you know, so and we have an unfinished basement, which is a little scary right now, it's because it's an old building. And so we've been thinking about maybe refinishing the basement so that we can store, you know, packing materials and boxes and things down there. So. That's been a whole different thing. Just selling online has been a, a big learning curve for us. But yeah, and I love this like so hands-on operational uh, experience to that too. You know, because it's really it sounds really real. Yeah. Um, you know, Alison also asked what your biggest cost is beside rent. So 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 if I now again like I'm Benny, I want to open you know uh, the Benny storefront. So I think you know that I think about rent. Um, uh, you know, it occurs occurs to me that I should, you know, put that into my uh, cost base. But what could surprise me that that hits you there, Patrick? I don't know. Do you? Do you... I, I'd say sure. Um, you know, when when I first opened, I had a lot of uh, collected a lot of pieces that I intended to redo, tend to refinish, reupholster, etc. I think it's been a learning curve of what I am going to invest into a piece and how much that customer is really going to spend on that piece. So, you know, great if I sell it, but how much profit are we really making? Um, so I've had to dial it back a little bit uh, where, that, where that's concerned. Um, what other pitfalls? Many. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I can also, you know, hand the torch over. Uh, Dennis, Laura, you know, what, what were for you are the biggest cost or surprising costs? I think it's, for, uh, for me, it's, it's the amount of inventory that it takes. Um, and we pride ourselves on selling things that are very unique and special. And so, obviously, they, those items a lot of times have a bigger price uh, to acquire. So... Uh, that to me is like, you know, having, making sure that you have enough cash flow or have enough reserve to be able to purchase something because, you know, when people come in and I'm, I'm notorious for, I love, I, I actually do all the styling here at the store. So um, when they can nail me down to get me to do it. And so I get everything perfect. And it's kind of like, you know, they have to remind me when the piece, when I walk in and the piece is gone, you know, that anchored the whole area. And I'm like, wait, what's going on? And they remind me, oh, wait, we are a business. We're trying to make money here. So it's quite okay that it sold. And I'm like, we're devastated. <laughs> but, um, you know, because you, if you, just to maintain the, the inventory, because we sell a lot of furniture. And, you know, we, we actually even opened, we have a, we have an in-house upholstery uh, division that I decided to do, we decided to do as a team about five years ago. And basically that was just, it was so much easier to have it in-house. So I could just walk to the back of the store and to see if they were, you know, if it was being done correctly or whatever and save a lot of time. And, um, and it's, it's one of those things that we don't, it's probably not extremely profitable, but it is such a convenience that even if it breaks even and it's employing people, uh, it's, it works really well for us. So it just different things like that, but I'd say inventory for us is mostly keeping, keeping that up, keeping that going. So interesting. I now know where I'm going to upholster my, uh, you know, my chairs. Now. Uh, um, Laura, what's been for you? Or what is the biggest cost next to rent for you? Um, probably employees, which is why, and you know, I say that, but then I also kind of take it back because we do try to have whoever's in the shop capable of helping us with design projects. So they're not, they're not designers but they are people who we could have them do drawings, we can have them do sourcing, we can have them do administrative tasks that relate to the uh, like project management, let's say, of a, of a um, design project. So we kind of think of them as uh, contributing to both companies at the same time, which makes them not like a significant overhead for the shop. 
Mm -hmm. um, we definitely need the warm body to be in the shop, somebody who can, you know, um, be here for the shop. But we try to have them be somebody who can, um, we can have them be like a, a benefit to both companies. Um, yeah, and, and the inventory, inventory. We don't, we don't really carry much furniture, so it's not a huge amount of, um, it's not a huge amount of money that we're spending on inventory. It's really more just cycling through and, you know, buying new things all the time. Yeah, and I mean also, you know, like uh, technically it's not a cost, it's, but it takes a lot of cash. Right. Uh, right, that um, obviously you might want to spend in a different way. Um, Paige also asked, uh, I think, a very interesting question. Thank you, Paige, for, for writing this in here. Uh, how have your shops fared during the pandemic? Does it make you second guess owning a shop? I wanted to open one as far as I, um, uh, for as a long time as I can remember, but the state of the world makes me nervous. Um, you know, is this a moment for you where you say now is even better than ever? And uh, Laura, you spoke about the online shop um, and maybe you, you just also go first, or is that something where you um, say, Dennis, like you, you know, maybe it's the second time that you just decide uh, to move on. Uh, Laura, what, what's your take on the pandemic and your shop? We luckily have actually um, done really well, um, despite being closed. Um, we have actually had our best um, few months with the pandemic, which is kind of crazy. We've been doing better online than with the store. Um, we've been taking appointments, but for the most part, we've only been selling online since we closed our doors on March 13th. So, um, but we've, we've had a really, really good summer. So, which is why I was saying now we have the opposite, you know, or an added um, uh, challenge to trying to, you know, ship things out and have a sort of a little warehouse here in the store. Um, I think it just depends on where you are, I suppose, and depends on, you know, your marketing strategy to, or, or if you are selling online, of course, if you're not selling online, it's, it's a very challenging time to just close your doors completely. Um, but yeah. yeah. Patrick, I mean, you said that you've changed your strategy a little, you know, was that always out of the belief that now, you know, a shop more than ever, or did you also have doubts in the last months? I think it's been now more a shop than ever, just simply because of the, over the three years, building these different relationships that I've, you know, built during design projects and, and seeing that the customer, we've built a really loyal customer base and they keep coming back and uh, the word is spreading. Um, and I also, a lot is closed, you know, in, the, in this particular area. I'm sure that's true all throughout the country. Um, so it, le it leaves, you know, a window of opportunity too, um, to, you know, service people that, that really are not there. There's also been, you know, sadly, you know, reported in the news, so many people have moved out of New York and are moving into this area in particular. So. I think more than ever, it will be a one, I, you know, it's been the busiest I've ever been as a designer working on projects seven days a week. Um, and I have a feeling that it's going to be like that, I hope, when we reopen that door. I've sold through Instagram, I've sold by appointment here and there to loyal clients. And um, I, I, I do think, you know, we all are in this industry that focuses on the home. And um, I think, it's, it's more important than ever. It's the only place a lot of us can, can go. And yeah. we, want to, we want to make our homes, whether it's a small napkin that's new or you know a beautiful new headboard or a great, incredible antique, antique piece of furniture, it's, an, it's, um, it's more enticing than ever to, to the public, I think. And I think you also mentioned an important part, you know, that is marketing strategy. And maybe, Dennis, I, I changed my question a little, or morphed the question to, into the next question that uh, Carter actually asked, you know, what, is, what has been your best marketing strategy or what do you base your market strategy, marketing strategy on to be successful with your store? So this is constantly an evolution for us. Um, even before the pandemic, I think we realized that we needed to um, take into account how social media was had changed the landscape. Um, 
And so we had kind of started doing that, saying, hey, we need to, you know, we need to post things on Instagram or we need to Facebook, how, whatever, you know, the social media outlet was. So we had kind of started that, but I think with the pandemic, it has definitely given us more sense of urgency. And uh, we do sell a considerable amount of inventory online through, we're, we're on the, we're represented on the first dibs platform and we sell, a, it's been very, very successful for us. Um, so a lot of our things, I would say maybe even 60 to 70% of the things that are sold through our store leave Houston um, and go to everywhere from Australia. We've shipped things to Hong Kong, London. So, which has been nice for me because like I said, I like to buy and sometimes the things that I buy may not be so suited for someone here locally. They may not like, but, but someone in New York or San Francisco would be. So um, I think, like I said, just the urgency of trying to figure out how to, to change our marketing strategy. And that's why, like I said before, we're, we've got to get this point of sale thing going as soon as we can on our uh, website. Yeah, but I, I think, you know, so, so, you know, own website is important, but I also think it's interesting to say, look, we, we go both ways, you know, on our own store, own website and use for strips as another um, you know, um, sales channel. Um, Patrick, how do you do that, uh, especially with your quirky and, and you know, unique pieces? Um, you know, I think now when we, I'm looking to probably not with First Dibs, but I think I'm going to build a relationship. I have one, uh, love the owner of Cherish, so that's something that I want to do. Um, and we're going we're gonna to put as much as we can online. Uh, but, you know, obviously I don't think upholstery and, and uh, we're not going to sell fabric by the yard necessarily online. We're not going to be equipped to do that right, right away. But um, the pieces that have uh, stock and that are readily available, I'd love to get them online or the unique one of a kind uh, items. But I also think for us, um, and I, I've noticed this, that, you know, yes, it's great to focus on national or international market, you know, the marketplace, but there's nothing like your your backyard. You know the people that really live and inhabit the area that your shop is in. Um, the people that actually you know come in that door that you build a relationship with and a trust. Um, they're they're going to be your best client um, for for me anyway. You know that that's how it's worked uh, over these past three years. Versus having that uh, website set up where all the merchandise is. Um, I think we've, we've been able to have more success that way. Um, but I'd like, I'd love to, I'm trying to evolve it. And Laura, like, do you, you, what else do you use so that people actually know of your store? Does that all come through Instagram? Do you do Google shopping? Do you, like, what do you try to do that so that, or what did you do so that people actually did find your website and purchase so much uh, throughout the summer from you? Yeah, well, mostly Instagram, to be honest with you. I, I can tell you that I'm not um, a, a massive fan of social media in general, like for myself personally. So I do have to make sure that I keep on top of these things, um, both for the studio and for the shop. Um, but we've, I have found, and we actually have one Instagram that's for both the studio and the shop. So I kind of, promote things for domain through our Laura Hodges studio uh, Instagram. We don't have two separate ones. That would just be way too much to deal with. Um, and then, you know, we've actually done really well online, um, selling online right now, but we don't do an awful lot of marketing, to be honest with you. I think we, that's something actually, my husband and I were talking about this morning that we probably should probably put some more effort towards um, marketing the shop. Um, I think we assumed that we probably wouldn't at first because we thought we were just going to be closed um, for the near future. And then once we want, because we've been online for, you know, since before the pandemic, but it, we weren't really, we were re really more of that walking customer, um, customer base. But now most of what we sell online is actually going to California and the West um, for some reason. So <laughs> I don't know. Um, uh, I also got the question, you know, what level of investment did you need to start your storefront? So that might be a little personal, but maybe you can, you know, maybe you have a range or maybe you say like, look, there's like those three things, uh, just so, you know, for someone again, like I want to open Benny's storefront, 
do I need 20,000 to 50,000? I need 50,000 to 100, you know, like, what do I need in order to like get sale through the first six months, you know, of buying all the inventory? I don't know, Dennis, what would be your advice there? That's a really tough one because it depends on what you're going to be selling, first of all, you know, the, the, the level of what you're selling. Um, I would just say that the thing, whatever the, the number you come up with, just make sure that you're not undercapitalized because it's a tremendous amount of stress anyway. Um, you know, I don't know if I could put a, a, an actual number on it. Um, just do your homework, definitely. Know what you're getting into. Those are the things that I, you know. But probably like get, get having cash to pay your rent for a year. Oh, absolutely. Right? You need, like, I would say absolute minimum six months. For me, I would, you know, I would want at least six months. Of, Any other th rule of thumb, Laura, Patrick, do you have, you know, for someone who starts a job shop? I mean, I'll be, I'll tell very personally <laughs> that I really never had a lot of money at all to, to open up a shop. I mean, yes, it's smart to have, and I probably had six months, but um, I did it because, again, like I saw that that lease sign, and I called, and it was the right number, and I said, you know, I'm going to try this, um, and I've been fortunate enough to keep it going. But I started with like under five thousand dollars, if you can believe it. I mean, really, kind of very, very, very low. I started with a few things, and I was fortunate enough to lean on friends who make incredible things, you know whether it's uh, textiles or, or tableware or artists who I'm friendly with. And they, they you know, believed in my ability to be able to, to sell it. And uh, without that, I probably would not have been able to open up that shop. You know, I never was able to get the, just the, hand, the bag that I wanted or the right label necessarily. But I also think that with a homemade kind of um, scrappy feel, to, to especially a, a retail shop now, it's, it's really missing out there. You know, everything is polished perfectly and everything is um, slick and marketed and et cetera. So I, it's hard to find that real true mom and pop kind of individual place. And I think people feel that um, when they come to our shop. So it's, it's, it's growing and evolving. I'd recommend to anyone though, save, save, save up because you never have enough. <laughs> Um, thank you. I mean, the hour is almost over. So I want to ask one last question and maybe, you know, Laura, you want to just like give it a quick start. Who would you recommend to open a shop? Who would you say, oh my God, fingers off, don't do it. Um, I would say anybody who just loves being an entrepreneur because you have to have that passion for doing something that you really believe in. I think that if you are going to do something like a shop, you just have to be ready for it to not necessarily be successful, um, like right off the bat at least. <laughs> and I think that if you love interior design though, and you have your shop supporting what you're doing, um, you know, we went into it relatively low risk in that we had purchased the building. We try to present it so that we are, um, we're paying ourselves so that we, you know, we're representing what the cost really would be so that we're not like, you know, just pretending <laughs> to have a shop. But um, yeah, I just would say that, you know, have a, have a mindset for owning a business because there's there's so many ups and downs with it you can't go into it thinking like oh my gosh i'm just going to make tons of money it's going to be amazing right off the bat you have to be ready to really put in the work dennis what would you who would you say like do it or who would you say like oh my god stay away um definitely someone who's got the passion for their vision um you have to really i I think you really, to be very so you really want to have to really, really, really want it. Um, you know, I don't think there's really room for brick and mortar for Mandy Pandy. This could be okay, or maybe this won't fly. This will work or will not work. Um, and someone that's not afraid to work, because you're probably going to work your butt off. <laughs> so, I mean, that's, I have, I mean, literally during the remodel, I have torn down the walls. I have put sheetrock up. You know, because when you don't have a lot of money, and trust me, we did a lot like Patrick. We started very low. And when I say have six months in the bank, that doesn't necessarily mean that's what we did. That's just what I would recommend. <laughs> so you don't have the ulcer that I did, okay? But uh, yeah, just someone that really, really wants it. And you know what? Go for it. If you really want it and you're dreaming about it, don't let anyone tell you. There's always a way. Yeah. Yeah. I agree. Patrick, is that you? That's also your... 
I agree. I think it's, um, I, I think all of us, and, and you too, Benny, running the business you run, you know, it's seven days a week, <laughs> especially if you think you're going to be, have an interior, uh, private clients and have this shop. And, and if you don't love talking to people and romancing and interacting, you know, I mean, it, the internet's wonderful and great, but at the end of the day, it really comes down to interaction face to face with people. And that, that's why you build, a, a, that's how you build a customer base, you know, because people fall in love with, with coming in with, with the people that are there and, and they want to, um, you know, you build a relationship. Absolutely. Thank you. Yeah, thank, I mean, thank you to the three of you so much. Um, it's been wonderful. And I also want to thank you to give us such honest and personal uh, answers, you know, I think that's really what everyone appreciates. Um, and um, yeah, it's been wonderful having you. Uh, we all gonna, you know, try to get your sales numbers up because we all gonna start like, uh, you know, going on your home pages. And um, yeah, thank you for joining us today, everyone out there. Um, you know, please share on Instagram what we're doing. I think that's uh, that would be wonderful for us and spread the word so that people, you know, more people benefit from these webinars. And uh, Laura, Dennis, Patrick, be well, be safe, and thank you for joining and sharing all your experiences today. Thank you. Thank you. Take care. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.